California. Okay. All righty. You ready for this? Y'all ready I don't for know. this? I don't know. I don't know. We didn't talk about this at all in our production meeting. <laughs> about saying, are you ready for this? We uh, didn't talk about that? No. Uh, the case at all. Oh, I know. I don't want you to know shit. Okay. Welcome to Talking Douche Nozzles. <laughs> Welcome to Hairless Talking Douche Nozzles. We'll get to that. We'll get to that point. Um, not really. This is just the tipsters, and I'm your host, Ephraim Zimbalist Jr. <laughs> no, oh, I'm not. Boy. It's Melissa Morgan. Uh, we do talk about douche nozzles, but it's the kind that take other people's lives. Uh, my beautiful and talented co-host this week is Joshua Bevan, and he is here with me, and we need to hop on the fact right at the beginning that the cougars are going wild for Joshua. I, I am reading all of these. I'm loving all these comments. <laughs> cougars gone wild. It. So here are some examples. Oh, boy. Christiane said, <laughs> he's cute too i'm not sure what two means but t-o-l like, like you're cute and i'm cute also no i think it was all about you it really didn't have anything to do with me diane says i agree to christy's comment oh perfect uh jennifer emily ann says he's hot yeah i like it yeah uh just to let you know she is a uh, recently divorced yoga instructor oh there you go. So she's flexible. Yes. That's what extremely. you're telling me. Yep. Excellent. Tracy says, easy on the eyes. Nice. Emily says, loving the hair and makeup, flawless as usual. But I think that was about I'm, me. I'm sure that. I'm, <laughs> I appreciate that compliment, but I'm not going to own that one. That was about me. Uh, Allison said, it's great to find a friend like Joshua. I want him. And I said, get in line, sister. Nice. Yeah. So... You know, how does it feel to be a heartthrob? You know, I'm not exactly used to this, but uh, I'll take it. You're, I like it. You're my, leaning in? I, absolutely. My my battered ego is is <laughs> absolutely loving it. Yeah. Um, I, you know, I didn't know if we should bring up the fact that you're like the, the hot podcast guy. I didn't know, but I thought all I did was post a picture of us on Facebook and all these, you know, middle-aged hussies went wild. Listen, I like it. Uh -huh. I appreciate it. I believe what you said to me was age is just a number. Age is just a number. And I was like, mine is unlisted. <laughs> so. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so uh, I will let you Perfect. tell the hussy listeners right. if you are available. Oh, listen, I'm beyond available. <laughs> I am listed all over the place. You've asked me to put your name and yeah, number in just women's it, bathrooms. Yes. Yeah. Can you yeah, please yeah. write it on the walls? Yes, and, totally. Yeah. I'm like your new marketing director. Yeah. Whether I want to be or not. I didn't plan on that, but it's uh, turned out to be that, yeah, the listeners are going wild for the Joshua. So. Thank you. Yeah. Thank yeah, you. I appreciate fun. the promotion. Yeah. Yeah. I but like hey, it. I live to serve you, my king. Like I'm here for you. <laughs> I am here for you. Seriously. Oh, no boy. one's ever been like, you know oh she's so pretty no one and literally one picture of us you wearing a just the tipsters baseball cap which was the whole point i was like right. i got him to wear a baseball cap yeah. and then all these old ladies go wild i, it's I a, shouldn't call them old ladies but you know it's a cool cap thank you i appreciate it's it it's my and pleasure i i mean i love your logo this is i do too this it's it's super fitting. It's it's awesome. Yeah, thank you. And yeah, and I'm I've worn it many times. In I'm happy the last to hear that. That makes weeks. me happy. Yeah, that makes me you. very happy. So, so I guess we'll just start getting like emails and letters and perfumed letters and stuff Sweet. like that. Yeah, I'll send. I'll I'll start compiling Formal. everything. Yeah, to just you. I'll get like a big mail bag. Big bags. Yeah. You'll you'll come in. I'll come in every week to yeah. to record. And you look it'll like be... I'll look like Santa. Yes. With a bag over Perfect. my shoulder of all of your fan mail. Excellent. Just so you know, yeah, I never generated any of that. So let me just tell you yeah. what I'm saying. So we do want to discuss our upcoming, I'm very excited for uh, our new sponsor. And it wouldn't be happening, and Joshua's already laughing. I'm already laughing. It wouldn't be this happening is... if it weren't for Joshua, because we are uh, in a relationship with Manscaped, which sounds, there's nothing I can say that will make it sound not dirty. Right. But so uh, Joshua and I are in a relationship with Manscaped. It makes it sound like there's it's a three-way. Mm. 
But. Which I'm also not opposed to. It's right, really, right. I have heard that about you. I have heard that about you. So it's here's the exciting part. It's supposed to arrive very soon, like as in today. Yes. And then you will have your own Manscaped kit. And then in a few weeks, Joshua will, will uh, come on and talk about how remarkable his area is. I hope. Let's let's hope it it actually works as, oh, I, as I they think claim. It works. I think I think it works, and it's. I'm sure we're going to have <laughs> so much fun talking about oh it. Uh, how about if I yeah. promise to not post pictures of the before and after on Facebook? You you're promising not to. You're yeah, just going to keep yeah, yeah. those to yourself yeah, yeah, when yeah, I text yeah. them right. to you, or any special listener who writes in or makes a compliment. Oh, perfect. About Joshua, I can forward them pictures. Right. Of the before and after, because I believe <laughs> what you said this week was, thank God it's on its way. Things are getting foresty <laughs> down there. I believe the word foresty was t- bandied oh, about. And I was like, I don't know <laughs> that I needed to hear that. Boundaries. Oh, we need oh, boundaries. Boy. So, yeah. We keep a very professional relationship. <laughs> no, we do not. <laughs> You couldn't if you tried every single thing I say. We are both 12-year-old boys, and it's terrible. We spend most of our time like covering our mouths and giggling at, yeah. at stuff that isn't even uh, – no one else would hear something in it, and yet you and I are both – mostly you. But I'm a close yeah. second. I'm a close second. I, it's not a race. <laughs> It is a competition. We, we can. It's totally a competition. We can both who's be middle more, school boys. Who's more it's of fine. a twelve-year-old boy? <laughs> right. Okay. So I have to say, and I keep forgetting. Thank you to Tipster Megan for her review. Her review was hilarious. Um, it says, "I love Melissa Morgan Humphreys. That is all." And I was like, you know, that's Aww. who doesn't need that. Uh, if you want to leave us a review, feel free to. You can say more than that. <laughs> Maybe something about the content or something, but I'm always grateful for a review that someone expresses love for me. Mm -hmm. So, and Megan is, and and keep your paws off, Joshua. She's married and she's exquisitely beautiful, but you can't have her. She's married, father of, father. She's a father. She's a mother of three beautiful boys. Mm -hmm. So you can't, she's very happily married. So step, step off. I'm just saying. Look, one wow. person loves me. A bunch love you. you Just let me have my you one. Can have as many let me people. have my one, man. All right. I also want to say thank you to Tipster Katie because she's our new newest Patreon, and she came in at the True Detective level, which is much appreciated. And she said, when I said, "What can I send you?" and I gave her a list of things, she goes, "I don't need anything. Just keep doing what you're doing." And I'm like, "Well, Katie, no, that's not the way it works here." So she's getting a package in the mail. It's actually sitting over there in the pink and hey. the pink metallic package. Right on. Yeah. So, and then the other package is going to um, the deputy chief of police of the Waupun Police Department in Wisconsin. So that's um, an upcoming interview with him, a missing person from Wisconsin. Um, I was uh, told about an unsolved homicide from nine years ago in Ohio from Tipster Melissa, and it's really good. It actually has a little bit of a connection to what we're going to talk about today. Um I'm hesitating on this one. I'm just, I'm balking a little bit, but I think it'll be a good one for me and you. It's another murderous author. Oh, we're, we're, we're having a theme now. Yeah. You're, we're, we're theming it up, but we're breaking it up with this one. So it's, it's, uh, not, it's a little more proactive and premeditated than Delia Owens. Okay. It's, it's, it's kind of, I, I don't understand how these things happen and people go on to have big writing careers anyway. Um, and then the, I'm really excited about this. Um, I get to speak with the survivor of a serial killer here in Southern California. Oh, wow. I had an interview, just a conversational interview with her last weekend and she is a remarkable human being. I know. And I'm really excited about that. So very cool. This episode is about a, terrible human being and that's why i wanted it to be called talking douche nozzles <laughs> because he is uh he is a tremendous douche nozzle and i sometimes i get like wigged out when i don't know about 
a serial killer. And it's like, how can you know about everything, right? Sure. You like to think you're updated on true crime cases when you've been doing it for a while and when it's been, you know, something you've been into. It, it does, I will say, it's um, it brings me a sense of relief when someone says, have you ever heard about this? And I, and I say yes, and I give them some details because it makes me think, I know what I'm doing. You know, I'm prepared and I know what I'm doing, but you can't know everything. And I'm really, I feel really bad about this one because this man killed 11 women between 1990 and 1994. Oh my God. It's a thing that, that bothers me. Like why are some people so much more talked about in the media than mm. others? And I have a little insight um, after talking to the survivor of the car to car shooting serial killer this happened to her in 2014 and he he was just sentenced a couple of weeks ago in in August of 2022. And there were things that held that up like the pandemic and uh, Mm -hmm. he wanted to plead, um, you know, insanity and was proven not to be insane. But I had never heard of his name or the case. And he killed five people and injured like 11 more. Oh, wow. And she said to me in our, we had like a three and a half hour conversation and I could have, over coffee. I know I could have talked to her forever and I I will be talking to her more. And um, she, she said, she asked the DA, why isn't there more in the press about this case? And she said, the DA specifically said, we scrubbed everything about him that was online. We scrubbed it. Huh. They didn't want anything out before, I guess, before the trial. Um, I guess they thought something might compromise. Oh, wow. Okay. Yeah. So I don't know because the, when I say the name, you might recognize the name of the case because it's called the Taco Bell murders. And I mm-hmm. don't like that at all. I feel like it demeans everything about this. And it's been, um, it was brought up to me and it was like, it's the Popeye's murders, the Bojangles murders, the Taco Bell murders. And it's because this serial killer worked with, I mean, he's a rare breed in some ways, worked with his victims at fast food restaurants. He worked at the Taco Bell. Uh-huh. Yeah. 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 Hmm. And he's different besides, no, you know, most serial killers – it, it's not a good plan if you're going to be a serial to know your victims because you're going to run out of people you know. I would imagine eventually you know? if you yeah. if you murder all of your friends. And, then... and he was on the way. These yeah. were friends of of that he worked with, coworkers, uh, subordinates, wow. um, friends of his sister. Oh wow! Uh huh. Oh wow! Yeah, and apparently he had um, maybe the gift of gab where he could, you know, kind of charm his way. We're going to hear that story from uh, from a family member of a victim. So his name is Henry Lewis Wallace, and this is from South Carolina, this case. And he, you know, the Taco Bell murders, I don't like that. I mean, there's like the Burger King murders and the yogurt shop murders mm-hmm. in Texas. And I just don't, I just, I get it. I get it. You have to kind of assign a name to something, but I feel like people aren't working hard enough to come up with something that is more um, respectful of the, the yeah, victims. It feels, it feels pretty trite. Yeah, it does. The Taco Bell murders. And you're like, wow. Wow. So Henry Lewis Wallace was born in South Carolina. And you know what? I don't give a shit that his mother, Lottie May, worked long hours as a textile worker. I don't care that she was critical of him for, you know, mistakes. I don't care that, you know, he was apparently, according to after he was arrested, verbally abused by his mother. I know so many people in my life who have had terrible things happen to them, and they did not grow up to kill other people. Right. And I guess we can always come back to hurt people, hurt people, but not always. Right. And I get it. You may not always have the resources to talk to somebody, but, you know, he... I'm going to say it was a horrible um, 
coming together of maybe an abusive parent and a sociopath right. because he was elected to student council. He was a cheerleader. He was a disc jockey at um, a radio station in his town in South Carolina. Mm. And then he, you know, did some shit there too. But so he went to several different colleges. I think he probably bounced around. And then he joined the Navy in 1985. And the same year, he married his high school sweetheart. In 1992, he was honorably discharged from the Navy. But by that time, he had already started murdering women. He started in 1990. Oh, boy. Yeah. So he was, at that point when he's still in the Navy, I guess maybe in the early 90s, they didn't do drug testing because he was using crack cocaine. Well, that's not good for you. <laughs> I'm sure that didn't help. No. Um, when he was stationed in Seattle, Washington, in the metro area, he got served several warrants for burglaries around Seattle. You know, he was arrested for breaking into a hardware store in 1988. He pled guilty to second degree burglary. And I feel like these things are ramping up. He's escalating. Yeah. To, it mm. very much sounds like um, the Golden State Killer. You know, he was in the military, he was a cop. He then gets arrested for, you know, stealing a hammer and dog repellent from a hardware store. Wow. Yeah, exactly. Um, so he uh, is sentenced to two years of supervised probation. And according to his probation officer, he didn't show up for most of his meetings. So in 1990, in March of 1990, he murders 18-year-old Tashonda Bathia, and she's a high school student. He dumped her body in a lake in his hometown of Barnwell, South Carolina. And it took several weeks before her body was discovered. Now, here's the thing that is really disturbing to me. He was questioned by the police regarding her disappearance. They questioned him? In 1990. And he didn't become a person of interest or anything? Well, he was that? obviously a person of interest, but he was never charged never with Never charged with anything her disappearance or her murder. So dude can talk then. Yeah. I, or they just didn't, because she was in the water for two weeks, they didn't have enough evidence. Okay. So in the same year in 1990, he was questioned about an attempted rape of a 16 year old girl in the same area in Barnwell. He was never charged for that. So it, by this time in 1980, his, you know, what was a four year marriage, five year marriage to, um, Moretta, his high school sweetheart, had fallen apart, and then he got fired from his job as a chemical operator at a chemical company. So I think things are, you know, ramping up, like yeah. you, you know, like you said. So in February of 1991, he broke into his high school and the radio station where he was once a, a disc jockey, and he stole uh, video and recording equipment and was caught trying to pawn them. So he's not smart. Mm -hmm. But I think he might have just been lucky for a while. Sure. So he re relocated in late of 1991 to Charlotte, North Carolina, and he worked at several different fast food restaurants. And that's why these things are known as the Taco Bell murders. He became a manager at Taco Bell at a, a mall that's no longer there, the Eastland Mall. So in May of 1992, he picked up 33-year-old Sharon Mance. Now she was... Uh, convicted drug dealer and prostitute. He beat her to death when she asked for payment for her services, and he dropped her body at the railroad tracks, but she was found a few days later. Oh, no. Yeah. In June of 92, he raped and strangled Caroline Love at her apartment and then dumped her body in a wooded area. She was a friend of his then-girlfriend. Oh, wow. Yeah, like he can't branch out, you know? Yeah. She was also his girlfriend's roommate and a college student, and she had worked at a Bojangles at the time of her disappearance. He had worked with her there, too. Is that fast food also? Mm -hmm. Sorry, California. Yeah. Yeah. I... yeah, it's like a Popeye's. Okay. It, that's chicken. why, yeah, it's chicken. Chicken fast food. Yeah. Got it. His girlfriend and his sister had filed a missing persons report on her, and it was two years before her body was discovered in a wooded area. He had gone with them to report her missing. Oh, wow. There are several stories where he shows up 
at his victims' funeral services because he was so closely related. Mm -hmm. A co-worker, you know, they were a friend of his girlfriend, his sister. It's really shitty. That is that is some balls. It really is. Wow. It really is. And that's why I understand why detectives tape every event when it's an unsolved homicide because there are fuck faces like Henry Lewis Wallace who show up to, you know, admire their work. Wow. Mm hmm. Yeah. So in February of 1993, he strangles 20 year old Shauna Hawk. She is a college student and he raped her. And then he also went to her funeral. She had worked with him at Taco Bell and he was her supervisor. Oh my gosh. Yeah. June 22nd, 1993, he raped and strangled his Taco Bell co worker, Audrey Spain. Her body was found June 25th, so like three days later. August 10th of 1993, he raped and strangled Valencia Jumper, a 21-year-old college student from Columbia, South Carolina. His sister's friend... Wait, wait. Oh, she was his sister's friend. Sorry. (laughs) Sorry. Matt will fix that in post. So she was his sister's friend, and he set her body on fire to try and cover up the crime, but she was found pretty quickly. Uh And he and his sister went to her funeral. He even sent her family, you know, condolences and flowers. Yeah. This guy. A month later, in September of 1993, he went to the apartment of 20-year-old Michelle Stinson. Uh, He is still a super, he was a supervisor of hers at Taco Bell. She's a college student. He raped her and strangled her and stabbed her in front of her oldest son. Oh, no. Mm-hmm. There's there's another child event, which we'll get to. He is um, arrested. So that's September of 1993. February of 1994, he's arrested for shoplifting. But obviously, police didn't connect him to anything in the murders. Mm-hmm. And we're going to talk about the police presence in this case also february 20th of 1994 a day after shauna's mother appealed to the public to find her daughter's murderer wallace raped and strangled vanessa little mac at her west charlotte apartment he knew her through her sister who was a co-worker of his at taco bell march 8th of 1994 we're i promise we're getting close to the end (laughs) Raped, robbed, and strangled 24-year-old Betty Jean Balcom a day after her birthday. Balcom and Wallace's girlfriend were co-workers at Bojangles, where she was the assistant manager. He murdered her, and he took a considerable amount of valuables from her house, then left the apartment with her car. He pawned everything except the car, and he left it at a shopping center. He's so smart, he returned to the same apartment complex on March 8th, knowing that Bernice Woods would be at work so he could murder, um, wait, who's, oh, Bern, I'm sorry, Burness, knowing Burness Woods would be at work so he could murder his girlfriend, Brandy. An 18-year-old high school student, homemaker, and mother of Woods' child, he raped her while he, she held her baby. No. And strangled her and put a, towel around the baby's neck to strangle him and he survived oh my gosh he survived so after that the charlotte police increase patrols and then there's two bodies of black women were found you know near these apartments he snuck in to rob and strangle deborah ann slaughter who had been his girlfriend's co-worker he raped strangled and stabbed her 38 times in the stomach and chest before taking money from her apartment for drugs her body was found march 12th on march 13th he is finally arrested he confesses for 12 hours wow it says here to the murders of 10 charlotte women but he actually murdered 11 he confessed to the 11th that he committed before he moved to charlotte he you know 
described in detail what the women were wearing, what they looked like, how he raped them, robbed them, and killed them. Over the next two years, his case was delayed because of, you know, the venue, DNA Mm -hmm. on the victims, jury selection, but his trial finally begins in September of 1996. And of course, the, the prosecutor argues for the death penalty, and the defense attorney is like, give him a life sentence. He suffered from mental illness. These killings were not first degree murder because they weren't, you know, premeditated with deliberation. I'm not sure I agree with that. Mm-hmm. So, do you know FBI profiler Robert Ressler? He's a pretty big one if you're into that kind of stuff. I'm a big fan of a couple of his books. Okay. He said if Mr. Wallace had wanted to become a serial killer, he was going about it the wrong way. I don't think so. He got 11 victims. He said, Mr. Wallace always seemed to take one step forward and two steps back. He would take items and put them in the stove to destroy them by burning them and then forget to turn the stove on. Oh, my gosh. I get what he's saying. You know, I mean, this is a guy who didn't hunt too far away from home. Again, as a serial killer, it's a unique situation. Mm -hmm. There are absolutely people who kill someone in anger or frustration or Uh, revenge and then oh my gosh I'm so sorry they've passed away but that's like one instance someone who repeatedly kills people in their sphere that just seems I don't know how he wasn't caught which I think is the biggest question most of the victims family members have I'm so confused by this right like how how did he get to 11 that is a great question So in 1994, the Charlotte police had asked the FBI for assistance. Now, here's something that bothers me greatly. The FBI said the murders were not the work of a serial killer. So the FBI came in, looked at everything, and said, oh, these are all separate murderers. Yes. You're not looking for one guy. I think I could be wrong. I think maybe because of his... Um, different MOs, some strangled, some stabbed, you know, some beaten. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's, it's kind of a rare, a serial killer usually has more than one signature. Sure. It's interesting. I feel like, I don't know how they couldn't have thought. I mean, I would think the fast food connection would be huge. How could it not be someone, whether you think it's a customer of all these places or it would be difficult in my mind to think it's somebody who knows all of these women who's worked with them, who is friends with their family members, their friends with his family members. It's, it's, I mean, you know, in one instance he burned the body. I get it. There's differences, mm. but enough of a connection. And the family members are like, how did you not, how did you not get this right. sooner? And I will tell you the explanation doesn't, doesn't bring me a lot of peace. So a psychologist, Faye Sultan, testified during his trial that he had been a victim of physical and mental abuse at the hand of the hands of his mother and that he had a mental illness at the time of the killings. And she argued he should be given life without parole instead of the death penalty. Yeah. June, sorry, January 7th, 1997, he's found guilty of nine murders. He's only convicted of nine. On January 29th, he's handed nine death sentences. Here is his statement to the victims' families. None of these women, none of your daughters, mothers, sisters, or family members in any way deserve what they got. They did nothing to me that warranted their death. Right. Wow. I mean, I can't even with that. Right. That really doesn't bring anyone any peace. Yeah. So June 5th of 1998, he marries a former prison nurse in a ceremony next to the state's execution chamber. Oh, man. His public defender served as official witness and photographer. Oh, man. Mm-hmm. Also in attendance was the manager of the death row unit. That's the creepiest it's... Florence Nightingale <laughs> thing ever. 
Yeah, uh, I I am here to help people, and I'm marrying a guy who ended eleven women's lives, uh, innocent women for no reason, just because it was something he wanted to do. So since he's been sentenced to death in '97, he's appealed to overturn the death sentences, stating that his confessions were coerced and his constitutional rights were violated. The North Carolina Supreme Court upheld the sentences in 2000. The U.S. Supreme Court in 2001 denied his appeal. In 2005, Superior Court Judge Charles Lamb rejected his latest appeal to overturn his convictions and death sentences. So there's a really great article on ABC News about the families talking about what this guy did. You know, all of his victims are beautiful young black women. Um, they covered this on 2020. I hate the fact that he's known as the Taco Bell killer, you know, but a, a detective said he would establish a friendship or trust with his victims before he would kill them, kind of um, positioning himself as like a big brother, mm. like, you know, a good friend. He was a, you know, he was a supervisor of several of the women he killed. Can you imagine you get a job to try and support yourself and your family and your supervisor who, you know, you think might be looking out for you or helping you along the way comes to your house and kills you. That's, that's just crazy. It's, it's the worst. It's the worst thing. He was, um, according to this detective, a perfect human predator. He walked into their life knowing that at some point he's going to take their life. It's that sick. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Even this detective is like, I can't believe he had the gall to show up at the funeral services for people that he knew personally and killed. But it makes sense that, you know, I mean, would it be more suspicious if you don't go to a memorial service of someone you know? I guess. Yeah, I mean, sure. If you're, if it's your, if it's your girlfriend's friend, if it's your, or your, your coworker, coworker, yeah, you're going to go to the services. You're going to. You're going to, yeah. But how do you, oh my gosh. Mm -hmm. you I think the one that he went suit. with his girlfriend and his sister to report the girl missing, knowing he had killed her, went to the police station. Yeah, see that you didn't have to do. That's mm -hmm. that's some gloating or, or yeah, you know what? You're psychopathic right. stuff. Yeah, You're right. Yeah. So there is a group called Mur uh, Mothers of Murdered Offspring that several of the the mothers have, you know, gotten together because they feel like they have no place to go and no one to talk to. And which victim is this? Oh, Brandy Henderson, the 18-year-old who had the baby. Her cousin, George Burrell, was at the apartment when Wallace showed up. And this was just so heartbreaking. He said he seemed like a normal guy. I didn't worry about him. Because, you know, she let him in. Everything seemed fine. And when she, when I left, she said, hey, lock the door behind you. Oh, wow. Yeah. So her cousin leaves, locks the door, and then she's locked in with her, you know, own monster. Oh, my gosh. Yeah. And then he finds out a couple hours later that his cousin, you know, has been, his 18-year-old cousin has been raped and murdered. And, you know, at that, Brandy Henderson was holding her son while he raped and murdered her, and he tried to kill her son, mm. but that didn't, you know. So there is an upcoming case from Ohio. I don't understand these amazing kids. Maybe they're, you know, like here for a reason. I don't want to get too, you know, philosophical or in the weeds, but, you know, Brandy Henderson's child, he strangled um, adult women. He tried to strangle an infant, and the infant survived. And there's an upcoming, it is, I don't, these kids, I know. Right. Um, there's an upcoming case in Ohio of a, a woman who is shot in her car that I'll be covering. And her one-year-old was in the seat next to her and shot and her one-year-old survives. Oh my gosh. And she was pregnant, uh, three months pregnant with her second child. She's shot three times in the head and she dies. She's found sitting in her Jeep. And uh, her child is next to her. Her one year one year old daughter is next to her, and her one year old daughter survives. I don't really know, you know. So Henry Henry Lewis Wallace strangled the baby because he was crying, and he tried to get him to shut up. That's what he said. Mm -hmm. Wow. As he's raping and killing her mother. Oh man. Yeah. Yeah. 
this is sort of interesting. I feel like it's Brandy Henderson's case that busts it wide open finally because they got the names of, I mean, he's the last person to see her alive. Her cousin is like, yeah, this guy, you know, Henry came in mm. and, you know, she was fine with them. Uh, they, you know, worked together and then I leave and she's dead and her, you know, son is strangled but survives. So they get a list of names of anyone she would have let in and they went and looked at their criminal history and Henry uh, Lewis Wallace had a criminal history. From the shoplifting and stuff. Uh-huh. Right. And the burglary in Burglaries. Seattle. Yeah. yeah. The only criminal history, but you know. Wow. So he's arrested on March 12th because this is the such a weird timing. That's when the body of his last victim is discovered. Of course, they don't know that it's his last victim or any victim. But he is seen on an ATM camera wearing a distinctive hoop earring. And he was wearing the same distinctive hoop earring in his late, latest mugshot for shoplifting. Mm. And he's using... Um, an ATM card trying to get money out of uh, Brandy Henderson's account and he has the card but he doesn't have the correct pin. Oh. Hmm. That's why he gets arrested. So D. Sumter, who's the mother of Shauna Hawk, is like, you know what? I don't know why the police couldn't connect the dots. I feel like there's a level of not caring. This is where racial disparity comes in. Oh, okay. Obvious connections, in my humble opinion, were blatantly ignored. And the police are like, look, we were overworked. We were understaffed. We were doing the best we could. A lot of those cases were on the desks of six different homicide detectives in the 90s. We didn't have the technology. We didn't have the manpower. And we definitely didn't have the resources. And I don't care. I don't feel like that's good enough. It's a list of reasons and tough shit. Sure. 11 women are dead. And I get it. They called the FBI. They did try other resources that they didn't have. It feels like a massive failure of the system. A massive failure. This detective says, it's not that we missed this. It's that we were overwhelmed with cases. Tough shit. Yeah. Wow. And how... Shit. And this is, you know, it's like Monday morning quarterback kind of stuff. You know, police chief McFadden said, reflecting on the investigation, it reinforced the lesson for him of listening closely to family members of victims because they're the voices of the victims. These murders should never have happened, but it made us better detectives and it made the Charlotte Police Department a better homicide unit. Yeah, okay, but uh, <laughs> right. the goal is to be better before... Before 11 women lose their right. lives. Yeah. Yeah. So they released a statement about Henry Louis Wallace to ABC News in May of 2022. And they said that, you know, the department was overworked and understaffed, unable to handle the surge in homicide cases in the Charlotte area at that time. The detectives who were assigned to these cases involving the victims of Henry Louis Wallace worked the cases as diligently as they would have any homicide case with the race of the victim being irrelevant to the attention given to the cases. The department also noted that following the Wallace investigation, they added staff to the homicide unit, implemented regular mandatory meetings of its homicide detectives to discuss cases in an attempt to better identify related cases. good <laughs> thank you but right ugh. shauna hawk's mother says about her group mothers of murdered offspring i just want mothers to come together and join forces in our hearts not allow the anger and violence that rule our lives i fight for this with my every breath i fight to be here living right now yeah well yeah it's just, I mean, I, I hate serial killer cases, but this one was so 
unusual and unique for me because he went to their services because mm-hmm. he knew all of the victims. It's it's a rare thing for a serial to know all of the victims. Yeah, how do you know somebody that closely and look them in the eye as you it. take their life? Yeah. I think his statement is fascinating too. I you know, like none of these women, your sisters, your daughters, your mothers, your friends deserve this. They didn't do anything to me. Uh, okay. What is it? Was that is that an apology? No. No. It's a statement no. about who you are. That is uh, yeah. No, that's not an apology. No. That is that's, not that there could be. Not that they there did, could be. They didn't deserve it and I did it anyway. Right. Almost like taking there was no credit for it again. In that. Right. Yeah. yeah, you're right. That's the word. That's the word. There is no remorse in that. So now you know why I hate covering serial killers. I do find the psychology, the psychopathy fascinating, but I also, it, this one is more heartbreaking to me because of like what you said. How do you know someone and do this to them? How do you do, how do you know someone and do this? I don't, that's like, a, I know a, a never ending question. Right. I mean, it's not like there's a good serial killer and a bad serial killer. No. But, I mean, 11 women, to me, how do you not make, how do you not connect those dots? And I'm not coming down on the Charlotte Police Department. I wasn't there in the early 90s. But saying afterward, this made us a better, you know, there's learning from your mistakes. And there's seeing 11 women die in four years. So many. That is so fast. It, it He really, and they were all in the same area. Right. I mean, yeah, I'm not, I can't give them any excuse. And it sounds like they can try and list the things that were wrong. These are issues that most law enforcement agencies have understaffed, not, a, you know, not great equipment, you know, it, it's, and that's why I'm really happy for things like citizen sleuths yeah, because absolutely. sometimes they come forward and can offer help or information or amazing listeners like the tipsters mm-hmm. who call in pieces of information that no one would have access to that, you know, that's why I'm a very big proponent of citizen sleuths, the one that don't, you know, insert themselves. There's a difference between inserting yourself in, in you know, in an investigation and being helpful. Right. I, I, I've said this before, and I know a few tipsters have taken me up on it. If there's a missing person in your area and they have, you know, citizen search parties, volunteer. Right. Absolutely. If you have any gifts, if you have, you know, online, um, internet sleuthing abilities, offer your services. Right. I mean, I, I just I feel like the most forward thinking police agencies welcome help. That's why I'm very excited to to talk to the law enforcement people that I know that want to use the podcast as an avenue to get more information. It's very it's very um heartening to me when a small agency is like anything you want. It's just as wonderful as when a big agency says absolutely. Let's talk about it. Right. It's it's just a huge it's a huge gift for me. So if there's any case that you want us to take a look at, any case you want us to cover, feel free to call us at 832 Tipster. That's 832-847-7837. You can email us at jttipsters at gmail.com. That's where all of Joshua's fan mail should go. <laughs> you can find us on any of the social media platforms, just the Tipsters Facebook page at JT Tipsters on Instagram at JT Tipsters Pod on Twitter and more cowbell.